Well, good morning and welcome once again to 11 Seats. I'm Kevin Williams of Survival Skills Rider Training. It's Sunday the 11th of July. This is show number 153 and it's a reasonably bright day outside here in London in midsummer. Uh, we had a bit of sun early on. It has clouded over a little, but hopefully the day should stay reasonably dry. Um, so if you're not out and about on your bike already and you are looking in, what have we got for you today? Well, we have a um, story that uh, motorsport has been saved as the EU Commission reverses direction on in some new insurance rules that were due to come in. A former delivery driver has managed to clock up 26 tickets from the same temporary speed limit cameras. The UK sales figures are on a bounce back on a year-to-year -year, uh, basis. Worldwide, wide, worldwide sales are also set to recover from the year of COVID 2020. A uh, veteran Italian journalist, Valerio Bono, has clocked up another long-distance world record. And today's better biking tip, I'll be sort of uh, trying to explain the idea uh, that um, there is some kind of difference between learning by experience to read the road and being taught to use a riding plan. Um, so settle yourselves down for the next 30 odd minutes or so. Um, do feel free to drop me a comment um, via the comment stream. Um, if you've got a question about anything I've covered in the show, do drop me a line. Um, I will get back to you if I can during the show. If I can't do it during the show, I will do it at the end of the show. Um, and of course, feedback on the show is always useful. I always ask for this and uh, people do say thank you very much or enjoyed the show occasionally. And it is always um, nice to hear because, uh, you know, some effort does go into these shows and so it's nice to know that people are appreciating them um anything else you want to ask uh, do fire away um right okay so that's um the intro um yeah the so the the first story of the day the um motorsports industry across Europe has been, at least according to themselves, under threat from an EU ruling for some years now. The, uh, the so-called VNUK law uh, would require all vehicles to have third-party insurance. So that's not just those used on public roads, so cars, motorcycles, buses, and uh, so on, but also vehicles such as mobility scooters, which are used in public places, as well as golf buggies and quad bikes, which are uh, sort of typically used in places where there are, uh, you know, people around, but on private land. Um, the European Court of Justice ruling um, some seven years ago uh, actually also included motorsport in the law. And that would have meant that all competitive vehicles would need this insurance. Um, so that would include everything from F1 cars to the kind of bikes raced by you know, young kids on the local motocross track. Um, what passed under the radar, uh, though, that got people really upset um, was that it would also have extended to uh, vehicles used within the household. So a, a ride on lawnmower um, going around the paddock to mow your own lawn, basically, would also have required this insurance. Now, not too surprisingly, because of the latter um, import. Uh, the VNUK law was one of the first things axed by the UK after Brexit. Transport Secretary Grant Shapp said back in February that the UK government um, had always disagreed with this over-the-top law and that they had had no intention of implementing it. However, that of course doesn't solve the problem for motorsport. Um, across the rest of Europe, because basically UK-based competitors would still need this insurance to compete within the EU. Now, the UK, as I'm sure you know, has a significant world-leading motorsports business. Many F1 teams are based over here. There are superbike teams as well, also based in the UK. And not surprisingly, the industry over here sided with the politicians, and they rapidly formed a strong lobby to argue against the ruling. 
The UK's Department for Transport continually pressed the EU to exclude motorsport and uh, was supported in Brussels um, by the world governing body for motorsport, the FIA, although possibly that should be the other way round. Um, but anyway, there's some good news. Last week, the EU Commission announced that um, henceforth they would exclude all vehicles intended exclusively for motorsport bought motorsport from the new insurance rules. Uh, the UC, UK's MCIA um, leapt forward to claim responsibility with Tony Campbell, their CEO, uh, saying that uh, with the VN UK legislation no longer a threat to motorsport, professionals and fans alike can, can continue to enjoy racing without the prospect of ludicrous regulation interfering. To have saved several thousands of jobs gives security to both individuals and the future of racing. We're pleased to have led the way in this outcome. I rather suspect the MCIA's voice carried less weight than the F1 Circus and the uh, the International Motorsports Federation, the FIA. But anyway, hey-ho. Um, of course, the uh, European Parliament doesn't always see eye to eye with its own commission. So there was some, um, there wasn't much support within the, the European Parliament either, it appears. Uh, Dieter Charon, Charonzova, who's the, an MEP and a vice president of the European Parliament at the moment, said, I'm glad we were able to find a good solution for motorsports in Europe and managed to curb as absurd over-regulation motorsports. So even the EU Parliament weren't behind this move. Um, what is the global impact of COVID on motorcycle sales? Well, the 2020 figures uh, are now available and uh, it's fairly clear. Um, there was a significant hit to the number of motorcycles and scooters that were sold across the world. Uh, 56.5 million is the total there or thereabouts and that number is down 14 percent from the previous year. Um, although it has to be said that uh, 2019 was in fact the fifth highest year for PTW sales ever. Um, in terms of volume the industry lost around 9 million units um, and the hit was actually largely the result of plummeting sales in two of the biggest and most important markets. India where bike sales were down 5 million which is a huge number and in Indonesia where it was 2.9 million that was lost. If you add that up uh, you get just under 8 million so you can see just how important those two markets are to the overall motorcycle sales. Um, a recovery is underway, however, and if current trends continue, um, it's uh, expected that PTW sales for 2021-22 could actually establish a new all-time record. Now, here in the UK, um, sales are bouncing back. Um, there are um, the latest figures for June are out, and what they show is an increase of 11.2% um, with 4,863 motorcycles and scooters sold um, this last June against the previous month of 2020. That's an 11.2% increase in sales. Um, it's up 28% on the 11,643 sold in June 2019 too. Now, obviously, we have to be a little bit careful interpreting that because the whole sales pattern for the last couple of years has been mightily skewed by lockdown. Usually there's a big um, spike in sales sort of in March, April, May when the new riding season starts. Um, but this year everything was sort of put back a bit and last year the same because of uh, lockdowns. Um, interestingly, um, Royal Enfield topped the charts in two of the newly defined sales categories. The MCIA's figures have had a bit of a revamp. And so they now have a custom and modern classic segment. And uh, Royal Enfield, as I say, are leaders in both those, the Meteor 350 and the Interceptor 650 Twin, um, both uh, doing well in those groups. So um, overall, um, numbers in the electric segment uh, are low, uh, 636 electric powered two wheelers were sold. But year on year, that represents a growth of 150 
three percent, uh, which is a huge, huge uh, increase. And what's the best-selling electric bike? Well, it's a scooter in the 50cc class, which you probably haven't heard of. It's a Yadea Sea Line, and that's a lightweight, short-range electric scooter from the Chinese manufacturer that dominates electric PTW sales in China. So this little bike has um, a 1200 watt electric motor. Um, it can hit a top speed of 31 miles per hour. Um, the removable lithium battery gives you the range of around 37 claimed miles so it probably does a bit less than that on a full charge um, so how much does it cost well the answer is it's just over 1500 quid so you know it really is ballpark in there with other lightweight scooters so really not very expensive at all um okay so don't forget if you are missing this show live and uh, we don't have many viewers today sadly um you can catch up uh, here on facebook at a later date and time or you can head over to my youtube channel survival skills uk where you can find other uh, interesting uh, videos hopefully um, the 60 second safety videos will catch your eye while you're over there um so okay who's commented uh, martin and nick have both looked in so i think it's probably you two who are the only ones here this morning uh, i guess everybody else has taken advantage of what is one of the few uh, dry mornings and possibly the fact that everybody will be home later to watch um, a certain game of football um so what else in the news well um how many times can you fail to spot you've been flashed by the same speed camera well the answer is in the case of one driver it's 26 times um the a uh, set of roadworks that caught this driver out were on the M62 near Warrington. They were set up for to uh, monitor a temporary speed limit uh, of 50 miles per hour. And uh, a Mr. Philip Dodd was caught driving between 56 and 63 miles per hour at no less than 26 times between April and July 2020. In one week, he was caught four times, and on another occasion, he was flashed twice on the same day. Now, he claims he didn't know about the offences because he didn't receive the notices of intended prosecution, the NIP, as it's sometimes called, from the police. But that was because he hadn't actually registered the van that he was at the wheel of under his own name. And so he explained to the court, the van was wasn't in my name and that's why I kept on getting tickets and not knowing I was getting them. So when the police finally caught up with him, he actually admitted all the offences. Um, he told Thames Side Magistrates Court that he was not a dangerous driver and stated that he had no previous speeding convictions. He also said he'd worked out that his average speed um, right across those 26 incidents was 56.76 miles per hour. Now, um, first of all, the oversight of failing to register the van for three months um, is sort of suggests that it's possibly not as careful as he was claiming. And the other thing I'd say is that there are vehicles that have bang on speedos. Um, I briefly had an, an, an XJ600 um, 20 odd years ago, um, and I was rather surprised when I checked it with a GPS that the speedo was bang on all the way through the um, speedo range. Um, it rather explain why I was overtaking things on the motorway. I was kind of applying my um, plus seven mile per hour um, usual adjustment. Um, my dad's old Corsa was also spot on um, all the way through. But just about everything else I've ridden uh, or driven actually overreads on the speedo when checked against the GPS. So uh, my XJ6, for example, is indicating 55 miles per hour at a genuine 50. So on that particular bike, a true speed of 50 57 miles per hour is actually considerably the wrong side of 60 on the dial. So, uh, you know, you, I, I kind of, um, if you're showing a, an average speed of 56, 57, uh, as you're getting caught going through the speed cameras, uh, I don't think it's a, a slip or an oversight. I think it's actually, you know, deliberate choice to drive over the speed limit. Anyway, that's my opinion. Um, so what was the outcome of the trial? Uh, well, he was given 78 points on his driving license. He was banned for six months. He was handed fines totaling 
just £520. That's a £20 a ticket. Uh, and he was ordered to pay £142 in costs and surcharges. And quite frankly, it sounds like a bit of a result to me. Um, I notice his occupation is given as former delivery driver. And Paul's looked in. Good morning, Paul. Nice to see you too. Um, in other news, um, I was surprised to see that a veteran Italian motorcycle journalist, Valerio Boni, has just achieved a 24-hour um, a world record for the most countries visited in, um, in, in that time frame. Um, and he only actually had to visit 11 countries in um, on his 1,244-mile route, roughly 2,000 kilometres, to gain that record. Um, the ride started in Sweden on the longest day of the year. Uh, then he took the ferry to Denmark, um, rode it down into Germany, through the Netherlands, Belgium, into Luxembourg, uh, through France, into Switzerland, across Austria and Liechtenstein, and not surprisingly, he finished at MV's headquarters, which is in uh, Shirana in Italy. Um, so 11 countries. Right, the stunt was part of the publicity campaign uh, surrounding the launch of um, the updated let me just get a picture up on screen there we go um it's the uh, mv augusta turismo veloz it's the 2021 model um as you see it's a sort of an adventure bike style um so the bodywork was probably um, quite handy as it kept off quite a lot of the rain um, apparently there was a, some fairly torrential rain conditions across Central Europe. And uh, there was also a detour in Holland, which um, threatened his mileage goal. Um, the 62-year-old journalist uh, uh, has previous, when it comes to long-distance exploits, over 40 years ago, Boney actually set a world record um, on a Vespa 50. Uh, most recently, he racked up, as one uh, magazine put it, 466 miles in 24 hours aboard a Polini pocket bike. Um, I think the use of racked up was probably an unintendedly descriptive term for what that particular experience must have felt like. Um, the MV was probably a lot more comfortable. Um, in case you missed the launch report, and I have to admit I did, it's another take on the 800cc middleweight triple. Uh, the bike pumps out a uh, healthy 110 horsepower um, at a fairly peaky 10,000 RPM. Um, and that gives you the top speed of about 230 kph or a smidge over 140 miles per hour. But what is quite impressive um, for that machine is that it's a relatively light 192 kilos or 420 pounds um but i have to say what you know what surprised me about that story is that the record is just 11 countries um i was sort of looking at the map very briefly and thinking that um, i'm sure you could clock up more than that if you visited lithuania latvia and estonia for starters uh, maybe i'm wrong maybe it's not so easy after all to put more together but uh, hey ho maybe somebody out there fancies the challenge um right okay um on to the final story is the um i'm basically looking at motorcycle training again um and to one of the perennial problems of putting bike training together uh, is explaining how the recipient is going to benefit. Um, now, Steve Winnett, who's from a company called Drive Tech, and what he says is quite correctly, coaching needs to be both practical and tailored. I wouldn't argue with either of those terms. Um, it, you know, if it's not practical, it's not going to work. Um, you probably can't deliver the training that's needed um, in the first place, and the trainee probably isn't going to use it. And it needs to be uh, addressed to the client as well, client-centered training, as it's called. Um, a a good example of a non-client-centered course, despite what the DVSA like to tell us, is the um, CBT, which is a sort of one-size-fits-all course. Um, although the DVSA kind of allow you to um, adjust the speed at which the content is delivered, depending on the prior experience of the trainee, which eventually recognizes it that um, many people doing CBT had actually done it before. Um, 
it still requires everything to be taught. You can just do it a little bit more quickly, um, which is really hardly client-centered. Um, but here's the problem. Um, Steve Winnett then goes on to say um, that behind the train behind the wheel training uh, gives drivers the opportunity to experience firsthand how an effective driving plan can not only mitigate incident risk but potentially shorten journey times and improve fuel efficiency now he says that participants in these driving schemes need to experience tangible benefits and he says that training should make driving easier or, and more enjoyable. Now you should see that there's an instant conflict there. Um, if you're running a business which involves drivers, then the company will certainly be interested in risk mitigation because it means they don't have to repair bent vehicles and replace bent drivers. Um, shorter delivery times are obviously a, a benefit too, and so is saving costs on fuel efficiency and um, also um, maintenance costs if you can keep the damage to vehicles now um, that way. So there are lots of benefits to um, driver-based um, firms, but how is that going to appeal to the average motorcyclists? Now, the IAM make a big play on shortening journey times, and they call it uh, making progress, of course. Um, but is fuel consumption any kind of benefit to the average motorcyclist? Uh, well, if it was, they probably wouldn't be riding a large capacity motorcycle in the first place. Um, they probably wouldn't even be riding a motorcycle because uh, a small car these days will probably clock up a better MPG than a bike will. Um, and what about uh, electric vehicles as well? We're still struggling uh, to get to grips with those within the motorcycle world. Um, but certainly electric cars are going to save you a lot of money uh, if you're traveling uh, any kind of distance. Um, so maybe a commuter or an IM member would like shorter journey times, but it's, it's hard to see um you know how having picked the bike over a car you're not going to get that already um you know the ability to filter is one of the built-in benefits as it were of a powered two-wheeler um and as for mitigating risk well you know the um, most bikers actually know full well that once they've picked a motorcycle as their form of transport they've already picked a higher level of risk so it really is hard to see how those kind of standard arguments can be used to sell benefits to the rider. Um, safety generally isn't a successful sell. Um, you know, arguing that we need to be more cautious really isn't sexy. Um, safe riding really has an, an association with dull and boring riding, although it really shouldn't. And there was a discussion on my usual bike forum uh, the other day, which threw us into stark relief. Now, I was talking about how planning our riding is an approach which basically utilizes a bunch of techniques that we can learn on the training course and which allows us to search ahead, uh, anticipate what could happen next rather than what should happen, and then come up with ways of dealing with the situations we might possibly possibly encounter, including what I regularly talk about, the worst case scenario. And um, I was uh, promptly told, um, not too politely, that I was selling magic beans. And this was all just another way of, of talking about reading the road. And what he said was that uh, all riders actually needed to do was actually head out on the road and pick up experience, and they'd be reading the road perfectly right without my help. Well, in one way, my critic was right. Um, reading the road is planning your riding, and riding, uh, planning your riding is read it all about reading the road. So, yes, there's nothing there which is contradictory. Um, all we're trying to do is uh, anticipate what hazard is going to come next uh, and to be ready to do something about it rather than suddenly finding we're in the middle of a dangerous situation, having no clue um, how to deal with it but what the big difference is that i am selling a structure in a motorcycle training course which allows the trainee to achieve this planning ahead this reading the road whatever you like to call it reliably um, there are three major problems with learning from experience firstly the event that um, you want to experience has to happen. Um, if you think about uh, something like the Smidsey 
for example, uh, many of us will actually go right through our riding career without having had a actual Smidsey collision. Um, okay, some of us will have had more than one, um, but you know they are not absolutely inevitable every time we go out on the bike. Um, we can ride for quite a long while before you even have a near miss. Um, you can ride a country road for a long time before you encounter the bend that trips up a lot of riders on those kind of roads, decreasing radius corner. Um, you know, you'll get around a lot of bends before one actually really causes you a huge problem. So you may not experience the situation you actually don't want to learn from. Secondly, however, you have to be able to learn from the experience when you do experience it. You need to be able to draw the right conclusions. Now, you won't, won't be learning much from a Smidsey collision, for example, if you simply assume that you had right of way and the driver should have stopped. And that's what should happen next time as well. Um, you know, I've, I've heard many riders, sadly, um, say, yeah, that's the third collision I've had this week. Um, and each time the driver should have stopped and didn't. Well, uh, tell me what they learned from that experience. And similarly, you won't learn much from running across the centre line if, as one person told me, those kind of roads are dangerous if they have those kind of bends and uh, they don't like riding on them. Um, <clears throat> And thirdly, the other problem with the experience is that you have to survive it. Uh, if you don't survive it, you've got no chance of learning from it. It's fairly obvious, really, but um, people do tend to forget that. Uh, and one of the experiences that people um, don't know about because it often kills people is the rarer version of the Smidsey crash where an oncoming vehicle turns right across your path. Um, it's much rarer in terms of numbers, but it actually ends up killing significant numbers of riders. Um, and the other, you know, the cornering crash I mentioned as well, um, where we'd run wide on the left-hander into oncoming traffic. Sadly, that one also is a crash that riders rarely come back to tell us about. Um, so the whole point of coaching is to use the trainer's experience, the rider coach's experience, to pass on what they know to the learner, to the trainee, um, but without the necessarily the um, sort of school of hard knocks style of learning. Um, yes, humans do learn by experience, but, uh, you know, as I say, we have to be able to draw the right messages and come back from it. Um, and it's a lot easier if you do that with some coaching. Um, the big problem, in, in my opinion, is still that uh, we ask the wrong questions when we're out there uh, learning to ride. Um, the what if question is should be at the forefront of our minds uh, and it needs an answer. We need to, having asked what might happen, we need to come up with a plan. A, a then we'll do this solution to that problem. Um, but the problem, but you know, the thing I see uh, with riders who've ridden and picked up experience is that they rarely have a, um, a, a an awareness of what could go wrong, uh, or a plan to deal with things that uh, are likely to go wrong. Um, the some years ago, I was actually running a course up in the Peak District for a rider. Now, he contacted me um, to actually say that he was a little bit worried about his speed. Um, he said, he, essentially, like many of us, he enjoyed riding quite quickly. Um, but as he got more experienced and he started to ride faster and faster, as his machine control became better and he became more confident with what he was doing on the bike, um, what he'd noticed was that the uh, incidents and near misses had gone up um, as well. And he wasn't sure how he could compensate for this. Basically, what he said was he tried riding slower, um, but he found that uh, was lacking the buzz that he was getting from going a little bit quicker. And so his speed crept back up. And of course, then the near misses came back as well. So um, there was a, a real difficulty 
about uh, dealing with that kind of problem. So I took him out, um, let him ride a, a sort of fairly twisty, awkward bit of road um, and to just assess what he was doing. And what I could see straight away was he was riding the road a bit like a racetrack. In other words, he was looking at the corners and treating the corners as the only problem on the road. Um, now, um, we should all know, of course, that uh, there's far more out there than just the, the bend that we need to be considering. Um, you know, we're in the Peak District. It's a rural area. Um, what have you got in rural areas? You have farming going on. Um, you have little cottages all around the lanes um, and you have little villages as well. Um, and of course, they're all connected by side turnings. So out of sight around the bends, there were any number of gateways into fields. There were side turnings and there were driveways. And he was riding essentially far too quickly to deal with with any of those problems. When I quizzed him a little bit, yes, uh, guess where his, a lot of his incidents had been. It had been experiencing vehicles pulling out or turning into these kind of entrances. And he'd also come across um, some other predictable issues as well. Uh, cars that weren't going as quickly as he was, um, the odd animal in the road, uh, tractors, they'd all caused him a few near misses. So basically what we had to do was improve his planning skills and um, as I've talked about before um, we need to know what problems there are actually on the road before we can deal with them um, it, it's not rocket science to actually think about the issues that you're likely to encounter on a rural road I've just mentioned a bunch of them um, but you have to be aware that they are there and then you can apply your planned riding. And you probably remember the system I like to use is search, evaluate, execute, uh, based on an American system. The idea is that you start by looking for problems. Um, you, observation uh, in the police system, it, it's um, a little bit passive. Um, as a former instructor buddy of mine suggests, it's, um, it, and it gives you the impression of a couple of coppers sitting in a car eating donuts on a stakeout. Um, whereas the search, is more like the sniffer dog wandering around um, investigating packages. It's a much more proactive term. So I'd like to use the term search over evaluate. Not everybody agrees and you're welcome not to agree, but you know, it, it is an active role that we need to take in searching out hazards. And then when we found one, we need to know how it actually poses a threat. Um, so it's important to understand the kind of trouble we're likely to get into. And that's where I just mentioned the the lesser known Smitty collision, the right turning vehicle that turns across your path. Uh, most riders do not know about that. They are unaware of that until it happens, um, which makes it a very scary event for many. And uh, as I say, some don't come back to tell us about it. Um, so we need to be fully aware of where things can go wrong. And that's why I teach what I teach. I teach survival skills. And then finally, we need that plan. We need to understand how we're going to get out of trouble, the, the execute phase of the riding plan. Um, so the rider in the Peak District, um, what was his problem? Well, there's nothing wrong with his eyesight. Um, he was clearly planning bends pretty damn well. So he could he could search out a corner, he could evaluate where the corner went, and he could execute his riding plan to get around the bend. He simply wasn't including the possibility that there might be other hazards um, it, that he needed to cope with. Um, and as soon as we started to think about those, um, the results were uh, you know, they were they they were positive. Um, he started to consider blind areas, um, the so-called surprise horizons and uh, vision blockers that I talk about on my courses. Um, and once he'd figured that out, uh, down came his speed in all the right places. As soon as he got onto a bit of road where he had a clear view, then off he went back with his speed. And all of a sudden he was happy. Um, he realized that um, it was the blind areas that he wasn't coping with. Um, so that's really the difference between a planned ride and, um, as I say, the idea that you can simply go out there and read the road. They're both the same. Um, the difference is that simply planning your riding is a more proactive approach and it's often 
best delivered through a training course. Um, so, okay, if you want to know more about the survival skills approach, um, do drop me a line. Uh, there's plenty of articles as well on my uh, various pages. Um, you can find dozens of articles over here on coffee, uh, dozens, hundreds. Um, I'm just putting 2018s up as I talk, so there's something like 500 articles over there um, to read at the moment. Um, there's also the videos that I've just talked about on YouTube that you can watch as well, all of which address a single point, a uh, nice easy way to pick up some experience uh, without leaving your own home. Um, right, that's pretty much it for today. Um, just a reminder, I do actually offer evening training. And at this time of the year, it's a really nice way of getting out and uh, doing a bit of training. Um, you can do it after work. Uh, we started last night at 7 p.m. and uh, we finished at 9, got our two hours riding in and uh, it was still daylight, uh, plenty of light to see where we were going. It was a bit dark by the time I got home an hour later, but uh, hey ho. Um, it might be dark from an evening ride out. Riders are quite happy to go on an evening group ride. Um, but surprisingly, uh, I don't sell many of my evening training courses, but uh, this time of year, they're really, really nice way to get out, enjoy the roads uh, when they are actually fairly quiet. Um, so that's it for today. Um, if you are out there on the road at the moment, I hope you've had a pleasant day. If you're going out later, uh, enjoy your ride and uh, hopefully Everybody will stay safe out there and enjoy the footy tonight if you are of a mind to watch it. So thanks for tuning in. That's it from me today. Um, Martin's just said thank you. So a bit of feedback there. Thank you, Martin. <laughs> all right. Catch you all soon. Next Wednesday is the next show. Bye for now.